Hello and welcome to another episode of Intentionality, where we talk about work and life. Today we have Oliver Jones, who is a game designer, an entrepreneur, and a runner. I see a quote on the wall which says, the best way to predict future is to create it. He is such a personality. Welcome to the show, Oliver. Thanks for, thanks for having me on your podcast. Very happy to be here. Intentionality is a very my favorite purpose. Being an entrepreneur, being a runner, is doing things with purpose. According to you, what is the intention? Um, according to me, it's about making a plan and sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, having enough, I mean, there are good and bad ways to make a plan and, and try and stick to it. I think a good plan, good intentionality is when you make a plan with enough margin for error mm -hmm. that the outcome that you visualize will come to fruition regardless of sort of the ups and downs of the journey to get there. And that's kind of the power of intentionality for me. It's a great way to put it. In fact, you do say that you started uh, with intention to create content for the world. With, to... with love. With love. Tell us more about Bombay Play. Yeah, uh, Bombay Play is just a, uh, it's a startup. It's a gaming startup based here in beautiful downtown Bangalore. <laughs> uh, and it's a bet. It's a bet on the talent of India being able to build world-class games for mobile phones for people all around the world. And I think um, everybody who joins Bombay Play, works at Bombay Play, uh, we hire people who really believe in proving that to be true. And I think, you know, everyone at Bombay Play has something to prove. And uh, we, we kind of envision a world where India is a major player in the gaming space and we're trying to create that reality. Yeah. You do say that you are a pro killer and you say that you have uh, killed 20 plus products so far. Is that at Bombay Play alone? Uh, at Bombay Play, yeah, over five years, we've shipped and killed as many products, yeah, 20 plus. In fact, 20 plus was, I think, only, that was just one year. One year. <laughs> yeah, in one year, we went all in on experimentation. And uh, yeah, we, we just embraced the sort of spaghetti on the wall approach of creativity. Um, no, not any experiment, but experiments that we could really rationalize to be viable and worth our time. Like we, we always say in the office that we only have so much time on planet Earth, so let's right. make products that actually deliver value to people. Right. Um, most, we've, well, from what I've seen in my own entrepreneurial journey is that a lot of businesses fail because they try and stick to trying to prove one thing, right. you know, or trying to make one product work when it's simply not working, yeah. you know. Um, and I don't, well, we don't believe that's the right way to, you know, build a successful gaming business. Uh, you have to just keep trying yeah. until you find that breakthrough and then you double down on the winners, you right. know. Um, this is a philosophy, there's a really great book on this by an author called Anne Duke. Mm -hmm. Anne Duke is sort of a former professional poker player and she, the book is called Quit, <laughs> you know, uh, which is somewhat different to the athlete's mindset, <laughs> but it works in a business, like quitting uh, when it comes to poker, uh, for example, the, the professional players, the players who earn the most money the percentage of the hands that they fold is greater than an amateur. Okay. Right. They quit more often and they double down on their winners more. Right. And yeah, that's really the philosophy we bring here. Um, and it's a bit of a, I, I think, I do take that, uh, I think quitting does also help in, in sport and in athletics in some situations. Right. Like nobody remembers, so there's something heroic in athletics about not quitting, you know, and just going for it and despite the odds. But, yes. but then in extreme sports, like, I don't know, uh, uh, let's say 1998 Everest disaster, you know, the, uh, it's like Bobby Fisher going up to the mountain and then a storm comes in, but he pushes and he right. gets to the top and he never makes it down. And, you know, maybe if he paid attention to the warning signals, you know, maybe if he turned around, 
maybe you would have survived. Um, and I, th I think when it comes to running, especially, uh, there are lots of warning signs, I think. Yeah. Like you're, you're about to run the Delhi Marathon <laughs> you're, and maybe you're having some warning signs. Yeah, and uh, you know, you can choose to push it. You can choose to try and run that race, but it might not be the best idea depending on the severity of, of the issues. So yeah. I think r runners, uh, runners who push through the pain or try and run despite injury end up causing more uh, more upset to their running goals, I guess, um, than the ones who decide to take it slow and try and recover properly and then come back stronger later. Right. Yeah. Running is not running, and building product is not just coding. The, the, there is a system around it. And you talk a lot about uh, building culture at Bombay Play. So what's the system at Bombay Play? Sure, uh, Bombay Play is a creative business. So the culture has to be like an honest and open exchange of ideas and criticism of those ideas. Yeah. And the creative industry is a bit difficult because there's a lot of subjectiveness as well in an idea. Mm. So um, it, uh, we also, I mean, we have lots of roles, like we have engineers, product managers, designers, artists, uh, people from all walks of life coming together and exchanging ideas. And yeah. somehow you've got to, uh, talk to everybody and rationalize what that what that product what is the perfect product that our team has the ability to build and give something new to consumers that they haven't yet seen before add some value to the world um, yeah so that's that's what we yeah that's how we try and build our culture here by we, we kind of follow the radical candor framework where we try and care personally about each other uh, while still giving feedback mm -hmm. and uh, understanding each other's point of view and not considering like point of view invalid because they're not backed by data you know I think that's one of that's a common theme that permeates every every business every like throughout India and the rest of the world is like you know if you don't have data to support it then your opinion is invalid but you know I don't I, I don't think that's entirely true um, I mean, you've got uh, uh, folks like uh, Democritus, in, who was in ancient Greece, who made the theory of atoms with no data, you know? Yeah. And he was right. <laughs> like, right. he just observed the world around him, he made some assum assumptions, and bit came to a conclusion that the world must be built of tiny, tiny particles that right. somehow slot together right. in different ways to create different materials. He was right. Okay, and it, the same way you think of a, a product, like you just have to observe, like everyone is doing their own observation of the world and forms their own opinions. And, you know, so long as they can articulate them and feel like they're in a safe space to share what their ideas are, then, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't want to mute that kind of uh, channel because, you know, anyone can be right. You know, if we think, having strong rationale beats having or that obviously rationale is a combination of qualitative and quantitative right. but having strong rationale is better than either of those things individually did this happen from day one or so the day one of establishing bombay play or did the culture evolve over a period of time just like how our farm evolves with we running over a period of time so did the culture evolve over a period of time um, did it evolve? I well, when starting a business, you know, uh, myself and my co-founder, we were always pretty. Uh, you have to be quite sure of what sort of culture you want to make, right. and in fact, the culture tends to come first. Uh, so you know, we went through the practice of actually writing what we wanted our culture to be before starting the company. Okay. Right, and anyone who joins, we tell them what the cult, like, in, it's intentional again, like, yeah. this is what we want our culture to be, and hopefully we don't fall short of these core values. Mm. Um, so it's a, I, I think in order to build a culture, yes, you have to plan it, but then you have to actually live by it every day. Mm. So culture isn't just what you write on the wall or write in a PPT or in a document, 
like that HR writes a document and says this is our culture. That's like the worst culture. Right. That's a culture that only exists on paper. Whereas the real culture is what you do and say and how you treat each other every day, right? So, um, like, even though we start, started with a written culture, we, we started at an ideal point, and then every day we try to sort of live that, live those values. Yeah, and uh, I can't say every day we are perfect uh, because you know it's a startup. At the at the end of the day, you have to move fast. You've got tight deadlines. You've got investors. You have customers. So, um, you know, uh, as much as you would want a business that is constantly flourishing with ideas and sometimes it's all about execution, right? right? And, but it, that's still okay, so long as you're, again, like one of our values, for example, is the sort of uh, authenticity, right? And if you are authentic, then that means being transparent about what we need to do and why we need to do it. Um, and what we find is that this uh, combination of authenticity and transparency gets everybody on the same page in the fastest, most effective way possible. I think that's why you're able to kill so many in Like, <laughs> in, a, in a lot of companies, like, you kill a product and everyone's scared. Right. You know, everyone's like, whoa, like, does that mean the company's going down? Does that mean we're failing? Because quitting feels like losing. Right. And nobody likes losing. Right. Um, but actually, when you explain the reasons, like, look, and, and uh, this is something I say, is like, look, we only have so much time on planet Earth. Do you want to spend it working on this product, which is not adding, adding value? Or do you want to spend it on this one that has a much better chance? Mm -hmm. That's where we're going to spend our time. So when you kill ideas, so you're being transparent, so transparent about why we are like it's, <laughs> I think everyone understands uh, the financials at the end of the day. If something is running unprofitably, why would we do it, you know? Um, if something is not show, like in a game, it's all about engagement. What is your gamer engagement number? How many minutes in a day do they play? And if that's not high enough, then why? That means your players aren't finding value. So go, you know, divert your efforts to the game that people are spending a lot of time on because they're finding value there, right? And I think that that level of straightforwardness mm -hmm. and transparency makes total sense. There's no point in hiding failure. It, it's no point in sugarcoating things. It makes a lot of sense. What's your system for running? Tell us about that. Uh, system for running is uh, I treat a, a run like a I treat a run just like I treat a product, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like a run is just a plan that comes together. Mm -hmm. And when you have a good run, that means you made a good plan. Yeah. yeah, and you just executed. And on the day, you don't need to think. You just do your training. Yeah. And people see like movies that come out and they look like, wow, the director must have had a bright idea one day must have just had a moment of inspiration and then the movie or the book popped out of their heads. It's like, no, like, yeah, they planned this, like every detail they poured over. And, um, you know, they, it, a lot of the time shooting a movie or writing a book, I think especially writing a book, is very boring. Yeah. And sitting at your desk every day and, you know, doing the same thing over and over. Uh, it's the same same thing with a with a run, right. but yeah. If the training, um, if the training is like not structured, then you're not going to end up with great results. So yeah, I think that's how I've sort of that that's sort of my philosophy towards running. It's just a product. It's just a good plan that comes together. Right. And when I'm at the finish line of a run, uh, it went doing like one of these monthly races. It, I feel great because it's, it, I think the only thought on my mind is like, yeah, this this plan came to, yeah. When I see that every plan, maybe it took one where um, Nakur was on the stretcher. Yeah. Um, so, so mostly I see both of you enjoy the run. So, so you both enjoy the run. I, I see that. Yeah. Um, so are there some tips that you want to share on how you prepare for a race? Uh, strength and nutrition because it seems everything is coming together 
<laughs> I'm not so sure. I think there's still plenty of room to improve on my times. Uh, like I ran Mumbai Marathon in 3.33. My PB for the half marathon I think is one hour 34. Yeah, but I like, I still think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Of course. Yeah, and because I'm still very scared myself of pushing too much uh, during these races, but afterwards I have no regrets because I know like I ran a good race, you know. And if I'm on pace, then I shouldn't push for more. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's like um, trying to remain injury free for the longest period of time seems to be the recipe for success. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think that's just a, in my point, from my what's worked for me at least, and may not work for everyone, is just like a mix of sports. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's why I, I mix in the strength and the swim, and you know I cycle as well. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like that mix, that mixing it up a bit, uh, really helps with overall strength. I mean, gym, gym. I find I find it tough to do gym because I'm so boring, <laughs> and doing like sports indoors is not really my thing. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, putting in those gym days, uh, I find that uh, really actually creates the biggest delta, mm -hmm. because or the biggest alpha, like because um, the really like on the really long distance runs. It's not really the cardio that holds you back, it's just your muscles getting too tired. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, when I finished the, the Mumbai Marathon, like I was feeling pretty great, yeah. um, but like I knew that my legs were feeling like weak because I hadn't done proper strength training. Um, had my legs just been a little bit stronger, so that's why I'm like doubling down on the strength now. Um, but uh, maybe you can give me some tips there because like balancing strength and continuing the uh, volume seems to be a tough balance to strike. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'll report back to you when I figure that one out. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> what about the nutrition? Uh, I wish it were better, <laughs> but uh, just trying to keep it like proteins, lean proteins, mm. not like I think. Um, uh, my own approach for this is slightly hippie, I guess. Like, you, your body knows what it wants. Your body has a great internal mechanism. It has, like, you know, the stomach knows what it wants. And, yeah. yeah. And it, the same thing for, I think, hydration. Um, you know when you're thirsty. Like, you don't need to follow a prescribed number of bottles per day. Your body tell, has a very precise, like, hydration meter inside of it mm. that tells you when you need to drink. And you know. Um, so the and I it the same is uh, same is true for all manner of foods like you, you know you other than junk <laughs> like other than sugars your your body tends to tell you um, what what it really really needs. Um, so apart from that though, yeah, just trying to eat I, what I would say cleaner foods rather than dirtier foods, which is what I would define as like proteins, but it comes with a bunch of bad stuff, <laughs> right. you know. So yeah, lean, lean meals, I think. Okay. Uh, I think that's especially tough in India because like the, the Indian breakfast is like terrible. <laughs> like, it's the worst. You get a lot of carbs, get a lot of carbs. You get a lot of carbs. A lot of carbs, a lot of carbs. So I can't, I mean, I enjoy it, but I can't do that every day. I cannot. Um, and my, my wife loves it, but uh, like I, I really can't eat that many carbs. And um, it, you know, I, I think it's taken, um, if you were to live in India, it's very easy to sort of fall into that bad pattern. Yeah. Um, so like we, we do things like, you know, I have, a, I have a cook at home and it's like just doing simple things like, okay, we're just gonna have a session where we, we're going to make salads. Mm -hmm and uh, we're going to like just tell tell her or you know make it yourself even like this is the kind of foods that it doesn't have to be fancy it doesn't you know just has to be chopped salad and that's what makes me happy you know uh, or just making a simple like sandwich. <laughs> so would you focus yeah. on balanced diet when you do all this? Yeah yeah like um, I mean lots of fruit and veg I guess 
um, but nothing like too. They just like I, I think a healthy dose of protein. I think that's the problem. Um, like my wife is vegetarian as well, so that's also an issue. So really, like understanding the protein content of everything right. you eat is uh, does does help as well and pivot towards the right. more protein rich stuff. Um, but yeah, like um, it cuts. It, I find like simplifying your diet often helps you just f find the nutrition that you really need. I think it's better. It's better to build habit, and when you simplify the food, it becomes easy to build habit of. Uh... Have you uh, have you ever seen like this uh, TV show Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares? Oh, yeah. And he walks into a. It's the same, almost the same script every every uh, episode. Right. He walks into a restaurant and he sees their menu, and it's like very fancy, very big, lots of pages. That's like every restaurant in India. It's right, like right. what kind of cuisine you want, they have it. Um, and the first thing he does is like make the menu like a, a short list of high quality things and you just go through that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then keeping things simple. Yeah. In the yeah. It, like, so <laughs> it, you can get bored of like the same sort of, but there's so much variety to be had in a simple salad. Yeah. There's so much that can be done with a sandwich. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Um, and, uh, I think another thing, this is an India, maybe more specific tip, maybe, but like um, fresh foods, especially seafoods, have become so much more easily available just through online services. Like, I, I won't name any, I won't want yeah. to plug, but you can uh, get like fresh salmon, yeah. you know? Uh, and you can get like a week's worth, you can get like 500 grams for 500 rupees kind of thing. And that's a great deal. And you can put that on in your salads, in your sandwiches, in your, in like, you can mix it up with anything or you can eat it raw. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I think, I, I think like if you're serious about nutrition, you would also explore these avenues and not just eat what's down the street, but you know, it perhaps is even more convenient. Open your phone and many apps are, you know, delivering on this yeah, and doing it well. When people yeah. talk about healthy food, people talk about accessibility. Mm. I think now that accessibility is already there. Yeah. So especially if you live in Bangalore. I, especially in Bangalore, you've got anything you want right. on your phone and you can literally get fresh salmon within sort of a few hours right. just, by, just by a simple order. So yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Keep it simple. So Mumbai was your first marathon. But but you did run marathon somewhere then, somewhere close to it. So was that a race or it was just fun? That was uh, me getting a bit carried away with training. <laughs> yeah. So you ran a marathon in the train. Yeah, right? I was training for a marathon and then I was uh, then I got carried away and I ran a marathon during my marathon training. Yeah, that was my unofficial marathon. <laughs> then I did my official one. <laughs> and 3:30 is. It's a great timing for the first marathon. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so that means you know all those monthly races have really built that endurance plus speed as well. Yeah. Um, like just two weeks after I did the Jaipur one as you well. You did, yeah, right. And uh, I like it was crazy. Like I I ran it and I thought I was very far behind, and I and I was like, oh well, I tried my best. I got my PB. PB. Yeah, right. I I'm. I'm I'm happy, I'll go home. And I went home very early after the race. And then afterwards they called me, it's like, you came third. <laughs> it's like, you got, and the trophy is in the post. So I guess that's another lesson. Like, right. you, uh, like I'm sure there's a lesson in there somewhere, yeah. but uh, it, it turns out that I started later than everyone else I was running with. So even though I, they were just like a few seconds ahead of me on the track, I was 30 seconds uh, ahead of them uh, if you consider the start line. So yeah, I think um, when I think that goes for your work as well, like it feels like your friends are maybe ahead of you, but they start, everyone started at different points and maybe relative to where you started, you're, you could be way ahead. Yeah, exactly. You could be third or fourth to the
Um, I mean, I'll talk a bit more about games here because if you look at it at a very surface level, like entertainment is a largely solved for thing. Yeah. And that's what makes gaming businesses or entertainment businesses super tough. It's like the NFL. It's like running the Mumbai Marathon. Yeah. You know, it's like this is the, it's a big event and everyone goes, like it attracts a lot of great talent right. and it's a super intense competition, right? Um, so when you're starting a gaming business, the question is like, what, how is my game going to be any different, offer anything new to the world? Why would people, oh, this is a common question. Why would somebody play, well, quit playing Candy Crush to play your game? Right. Because Candy Crush is already there and it's already very popular and it's also got lots of features and, um, you know, has a brand, all of this stuff. So you need to give that person a reason to quit to play and play you, yeah. your, your, your product. Um, so, like, after, to be honest, like, when we started, we just figured it's better to be in the game and building stuff in the arena than it is to be sitting on the sidelines and we'll figure it out. <laughs> you <Okay. know? laughs> uh, that's the, I guess, the true, like, what... Most experiment. Yeah, like, we, we started, we embraced, like, like, the... We, we sort of had faith in ourselves that we would figure it out with the right team. We just need to bring together a concentration of really skilled people and really smart people and we'll figure it out. Not sure what the answer is. So yeah. is, is that a lesson yeah. it's not necessary that you should have figured out the business plan yeah. or even your value proposition, but you'd learn by swimming. Yeah. 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 Like I think talent concentration yields good results yeah. and but in unpredictable ways. Yeah. So if you have like good running buddies, I guess, in the right. in that context, like you just need a bunch of good people together and then you'll start getting great results. As right. you're um, and uh, yeah, and uh, but when it comes to our games, what we really landed on was that, uh, like a lot of the games that like casual phone players, like phone users, is, are playing today, like Candy Crush, right. they're very uh, antisocial. So we wanted to make very casual games for the mass population that were a lot more social. Mm. Yeah, and so we would bring sort of playing cooperatively or collaboratively or competitively to sort of uh, to the kind of game your your mom or dad or uncle would play it's a social element um, using like embracing sort of new technology to make sort of social gaming available for the masses and not just the core gamers who love to play competitive games with one another in like PUBG or or BGMI, I guess, in India. Uh, not like social, competitive, or cooperative gaming is not just for them, it should be for everyone. Right. And so we just try to solve that problem with Bombay Plays Games. Makes a lot of sense. So when you talk about gaming, it's all entertainment, and I can see entertainment in your vision, mission, and even you talk about entertainment. Now we talk about MVP, but when it comes to entertainment, how do you test your minimum lovable entertainment? That's it, lovable is the key word. Um, so, it, it, this is the thing. Um, a lot of people will say you just need to build a product for one day. Um, and even before you write a line of code, you need to be paper prototyping. So you build a game with just paper, Jenga blocks, like any digital game you can imagine. You can build a physical prototype of it and test it very quickly and see if the core mechanic is fun. It might be slow, <laughs> but but you yeah. can solve the problems of speed when you start writing code. Uh, but yeah, um, so just playing with your team, very fast paper prototypes is how you figure out what the core of your game is. And that's really the hardest part. You can put any sort of framework around your product. Like, I know it could be social, it could be this, it could be that. But if the game mechanic, uh, or in the case of like a movie, if, it, if the core plot is bad, it doesn't matter how much CGI you throw. So it's CGI sludge, you know, that's what they, they call it when it's uh, when the plot is thin, but the visuals, they are like multi-million dollar movies. So it's a similar in games, like you have to solve for the core and make that super engaging. 
and it's much faster to do that without code. Um, or either by using no-code solutions or by physical prototyping. Yeah. Um, and then once you've crossed that barrier, then you make your vertical slice, which is just the thing you build, not for public or beta or alpha or anything. You build it just to give to a focus group. And, the f yeah. and that focus group is, can be just like 10 people from your target audience, not your friends, not your family, unless they're at your target. Yeah, they love you anyway. They love you anyway, and they'll give you random feedback, to be honest, and you need to really go to your customer as fast as you can, right? Uh, it's no good making something your mom likes and then, you know, sh shipping it in, in our case, like shipping it to uh, moms in the US and then like realizing it's totally not their thing or they have a better alternative. So, um, yeah, making a vertical slice then, you know, after you've proven that out, uh, it's really just about building one, like a game that you can play for an hour. And if you make an hour of content and people only play 15 minutes, it's a bad game, yeah. you know? If you make an hour of content and they play half an hour and then they come back the next day and play the, the later one hour, that's a good game, you know? They, like, sure, they only played it for half an hour, but they came back. And that's the important thing. They remembered your game and they liked it enough to come back. Uh, and that's really what we measure. We measure the session time and the retention. Okay. Yeah. And we start with the day one. Like that's one day after you tried the product initially, the day one. Uh, how many people, say 100 people installed your game on day zero, how many came back on day one? Okay. That's the percentage day one. And we aim for a certain percentage coming back on day one with one hour of content. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And that's, um, once it crosses that barrier, then um, like if that's high enough, if that's sort of good enough, then we start looking at day seven. Okay. Then we start looking at day 30, right? And if the drop off, it like sometimes it doesn't so much matter where you start, it matters where you end. Right. Because those people on day 30 are your real customers. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who love your product right. so much they keep coming back. And so what we, like the ultimate sign that you should be spending millions of dollars to, in marketing and scaling is when the difference between your day one and your day 30 is kind of small. That means that people who came back on the first day really liked it and they continued for 30 days of playing. And given all the entertainment available on planet Earth today, if you manage to keep somebody for 30 days on your game, that means you're world class, you know? Yeah, and uh, I think, I mean, I'm talking about this like a data-driven approach, uh, but it's a lot of emotion, like customer emotion goes behind, like the reasons for staying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I totally understand. And I have two daughters. They used to love Among Us yeah. uh, to an extent where they used to convert my entire home into Among Us at a physical game, and then they used to play. So like, so, so uh, one fine day they stop, and all of a sudden they stop playing that game. And so I asked them as a product manager, what happened? They said they have released this new version we don't like. Oh, that's it. So, so loyal customers, they lost with one release. So how do you take care of that? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's an example of, you know, iterating on your product without like degrading the core of your product. Mm. Like every, after a point you need to realize as a product owner that your core is sacred and it's iterative change. You have to go from making, like at the early stages, you're, it makes sense to do deep cuts. Yeah. You know, deeply changing your game to drive the results that you want. Like if you're not, if you've built a game that is not engaging people, you have to change it in some very significant way to change the people's mindset. And But at some point, once you're reaching the numbers, you have to start thinking additive, iterative. And you need to fine tune it. So in the case of Among Us, yeah, they, they made these new updates, but the updates changed the core of the game that in ways people didn't like, you know? Uh, and even, even if they were like good changes, they, there's still this chance that you know 
people just liked the old stuff even though it was objectively worse. Yeah. You know, because that's what they got used to. It's just the emotions of the end of the era. Like we've, uh, we've made games that are objectively like buggy and you know, have, um, have serious flaws to them, but we know we can't change them anymore. Mm. Like, uh, we're, like, I think a classic one is like upgrading the graphics on, on a game. Like you can release a game with very bad graphics, but people love the gameplay and then continue. And it might make sense for you as a gaming studio to just make it all in 3D or just improve all the graphics, now you have money. Um, but that's not what players want. They don't want like their, they like the original graphics. That's why they were playing, um, even though it's objectively worse. Yeah. So um, yeah, you just need to understand where are you in your product lifecycle, yeah. and then uh, you. Know, but that also goes for like your team as well. Like at some point, you have to slow down. You have to be a bit more regimented in your process. Yeah and you, uh, you, know, you need to code review, <laughs> you right. need to do proper QA, right. uh, because one bug as well that you introduce in a new release ruins it for everybody. And you, you, know, it, you, only, you do that a couple of times and you lose everyone. Engineering practices have to be solid. Absolutely. So just like you run a race every month to test your fitness, so when you do sprint review, do you bring in the players uh, for the review? How does it happen, sprint review? Our case, um, I mean, when we're reviewing a sprint, in in the context of like Bombay play, it's like a post-mortem and it's with the team and everyone discusses how they do things better. Um, but when it's in the context of like, have the updates to our game been positive, uh, that presents a bit of a challenge because yeah sure like once you're at a good scale then you're getting like organic reviews and things but the truth is is that people won't automatically tell you what they think like customers who don't like your products will typically not tell you anything at all they'll just leave they'll speak with their actions you know but they'll never tell you why you'll just see a number that was there on day one and did not come back on day two right that's the actual person you need to talk to, right? Uh, it's much easier to talk to those you retain, uh, but they'll only tell you why they like the game, not, you know. Um, or maybe they'll give you some hints about what, what could be improved, but is that really catering to the, uh, I guess, the dark side of the moon? <laughs> like, those, all those who, who left. Right. So, uh, for us, like, we do focus tests where we actually pay people to play test the game. Right. And regardless of whether they like it or not, they have to play it. Okay. And then we get their feedback. So like, yeah. that's how you get like, um, a more holistic uh, view. When you get somebody who doesn't, or play, ide the ideal person is somebody who plays kind of the same genre, or likes kind of the same thing, or uses similar products to use yours, and they don't like it get them to play it for an hour <laughs> and then take every all the feedback that they give you um, and I have I've sat through many hours of listening to our customers just complain constantly and one like you know the only reason they're still playing is because they get like you know 50 50 bucks at the end of it <laughs> and otherwise if they were a real person they would have left a long time ago but they're constantly giving you like actionable feedback mm -hmm. you want them to play you want them to suffer <laughs> so you can learn and it's for the greater good so you can hopefully next time they won't suffer so much <laughs> so, so do you observe in the play and yeah. capture their emotion that's absolutely critical um like not um, I mean, video of them playing, or of, like because there are some aspects to mobile apps that people don't understand just by screen capture alone. Yeah. Um, and I've seen a lot of companies make this mistake. They just do a screen capture and they capture the finger presses, and and, it, and the the average insight will be like, oh, they tapped on the wrong button, or oh, they weren't sure where to go in this flow. Yeah which is good, but it's just a small optimization in the scheme of things. Like the second layer on that is getting their voice, like getting them to narrate their experience as they play. That gives you so much more insight already. Just having them think out loud and instructing them like, as you play this, I want you to narrate 
ex like what you're thinking along these lines at every single point in the game. If anything confuses you, you have to say it. This is where like, you know, paid reviewers really help. I want to have qualitative feedback as well. It's totally qualitative. But then there's even one level above uh, having both audio and visual, yeah. which is having context. So, so yeah, yeah. So, and that's where, like, I've made some games for India, and as kind of an outsider to the culture, I've tried really hard to understand like the gamer culture in India, mm -hmm. and uh, so I've gone to like sort of tier two cities, tier three cities, um, to just try and be the fly on the wall, mm -hmm. get people to play the game that we're working on in a social context, while I try and blend into the background as best as I can. Yeah. And not only see what how they're playing, how they're talking, but how they're interacting with the people around them. And you know, it's like if you're stuck, who do you ask, and how do they explain the mechanics to their friends, and how do they describe the game to their friends? And I think that gives you, well, the a greater insight into the social context in which your products are being used, yeah. which is super critical, um, and allows you to sort of build a product which is sort of really solves for a, um, for a social like social need or like a, a, a need that a group of people have rather than just one person who's narrating and uh, doing finger taps on a phone yeah um, so yeah I think those are the three levels of understanding that uh, that are, can be sort of derived from observation those are two great practical insights that one can learn from oh, so sorry I know it's a this is sort of a bit of a running, uh, running and business podcast, but yeah. So, if I were, if you were to uh, provide tips to someone who is starting fresh as a runner, what would those be? <laughs> tips to myself, I can. <laughs> um, I, it would probably be routine. Find a great running partner. Like, my wife was my running partner, so I got lucky there, I guess. Um, like, um, I think don't be too cautious is another one. Like, sometimes you you can have a small problem and you feel like you have to be off your feet for a while, but sometimes that's that can cause, like, a total reset. I think um, something my dad always told me, but he always run as a team, you know? He run as... As a like a triathlon team, and it would be like strap up and move on, <laughs> you know. So only when uh, I, I think, just accept that while a, while you're a runner, injuries will happen, and just how how well you can move from one injury to the next injury is really the difference. <laughs> yeah, and do that in a in a planned, measured, controlled way. I think that leads to best outcomes yeah and um yeah running slow running slow is great <laughs> like, yeah. stop trying to run so fast um like you said, use the spectrum. yeah like use the spectrum uh when you're not feeling good just dial it down yeah. just dial it down so long as you got a run in it's good like, so long it's like uh, time on the road i guess is more important than how fast you ran in training in the race, it definitely matters how much time you ran. <laughs> uh, I think have good, strong mantras and uh, turn, I think last one, it's probably turn stress into fuel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a great one. Yeah. Just, and especially when you're working in a startup, it's a helpful one all the stress of the day yeah. if you're able to turn that into your fuel when you run yeah. then you have a winning combination you have an infinite supply of fuel <laughs> especially if you're working in startups yeah right. so what is next for Oliver the runner uh, just doing better next time yeah. yeah and always doing one more <laughs> so do you have a, a destination run in your mind I mean, getting the BQ mm -hmm. uh, at least once in life. Once in life. I think that's a uh, good enough goal for me. And uh, yeah, I, I think, s and then for the half marathon, uh, I, I think just getting, 
getting genuinely quick mm. and doing like this uh, I, uh, my first goal will be sub 130 and then hopefully I can get to sort of a 115 I hope yeah. uh, and I, I see that the you know slowly over time over practice I'm getting there and with maybe once I go into proper coaching I can really you might actually. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> or I might just crash. <laughs> You're doing great, by the way. Um, what's your favorite running shoe? Saucony. Saucony. Saucony shoes. They seem to fit my Wait, foot. All of them. Yeah. So yeah. Of your feet. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have Vaporfly also, but it just doesn't work for me. Mm. Everyone raves about the most expensive, fanciest shoe, but if it doesn't work for you, don't use it. And don't try and make it work. Um, like I've been trying to break in like um, my uh, Vaporfly for like six months and it's still not fitting. So like at some point you just need to give up on a fancy shoe, shoe and stick to the, the, you know, yeah. the classics. The one that your feet agrees with. One that fits your foot. That is the one. Um, and uh, good socks. Yeah. yeah, like it took me ages just to find the right sock. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is a common problem. Yes, I did not. You did. You got lucky, <laughs> but um, like I kept getting blisters, yeah. and only once I found like the right. And I kept like in training, just use that as an opportunity to keep like mixing your gear, I guess, because right. that's the time to do it. Right. And then, um, then uh, finally found the right combination of shoes and socks. Yeah, and um, it's a. It, but I find like. It doesn't have to be an expensive sock or an expensive shoe, but uh, it just has to be the one that is reliable enough for the long distance, yeah. What's your favorite athlete that you look up to? Oh, oh. Well, rest in peace, Kiptum, yeah. I was really excited to see him at the Paris Olympics. Yeah. Unfortunately, we won't get that opportunity. Um, but yeah, I think uh, he was a big inspiration for me. Right. Yeah. I think that that legacy will be there for mm. many years to come. Mm. Right. What's your favorite book? Oof. Uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, I guess. Yeah. Or maybe uh, one less philosophical would be uh, Philip Pullman's uh, Dark Materials trilogy in fantasy. Uh, as for adventure, maybe John Kakawa into thin air. I've already mentioned the Everest is up. The diverse. Yeah, and Indian author. Well, no, he's not Indian. Sorry, uh, William Darumpel, mm. uh, the White Muggles and the Anarchy. Mm. It's very. Um, uh, I, I was very captivated when learning about Indian history. From you have spectrum there. Yeah. As well. <laughs> it, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I I read as much as I can about a range of topics. I guess. What's your favorite food? Sandwiches. Sandwiches. Yeah. Very. You keep it simple. I, I, yeah, I realize that's a very British thing to say. Yeah. It's like nothing fancy. Sandwich. <laughs> What's your favorite game? Oof. That's a very deep question for somebody in my field. Yeah, uh, yeah I could go for a whole podcast on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but in summary: There are the games you like for nostalgia. Mm. There are the games you like because. I, I think there's an appreciation a game designer has for the design of a game. Um, there's the games that you think are wonderful pieces of art yeah. and games that you think are just very shrewd businesses in themselves. So when you ask me what's my favorite game, I can't really, there, there are lots of favorite Should we audition podcasts for that? Yeah. Look. <laughs> what's next for the are you the product guy, the entrepreneur? Uh, scaling Bombay Play to the moon. Um, like after killing 20 products, I think we found one that really works, that yeah. people love. And uh, once you're there, um, it's really just about polishing it and being obsessive and making it the best it could possibly be and taking it to as many people on planet Earth as possible. Thank you so much. So thanks for being on our show. If someone wants to reach out to you, can they? 
How, how can someone reach out to you? Uh, on, on Twitter, um, you could at Agent Ollie, Agent underscore Ollie. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn, Oliver Jones, co-founder of Bombay Play. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys there if you want to join me. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. It will, it will be a pleasure to run with you sometime. Yeah, same to you. <laughs> Thank you. Jacko Lake, let's go. Yeah, let's go. <laughs>